Shalom, and welcome to Christians with Torah, the Beit Tehillah Community Podcast. We believe the Torah is relevant for our lives today, God's teachings and instructions. You may very well be part of the first generation to be born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, and have the Torah, a Christian with Torah. Join us as we honor the living God through the study of His Word, topical conversations, and interviews with special guests. Please welcome our hosts, Pastor Nick Plummer and Ryan Cabrera. Shalom, everybody, and welcome to Christians with Torah, the Beit Tehila Community Podcast. I'm your co-host, Ryan Cabrera, and I am here in Studio B with the Pastor Nick Plummer. Hey, Studio Pastor B Nick. is our best studio. It, it has been very good. The longevity has been good. we got video now and audio. Yeah, yeah. For the last two years, right? Yeah, yeah. Last year so. and this year? Last year and this year. Video and audio. What an honor. You know, I think maybe this. next season we're going to upgrade to like having like different angles, you know, but we'll see. I don't, I don't know. Matthew's going to be a while. No, well, listen, we've been, <laughs> Matthew's definitely taking a little extra time. And you know, I, I don't have any, you know, I have no, no, uh, no regrets. I felt like we were getting Matthew, into this. We're, we're halfway there. 14. 13. We were in Matthew 13 for a long time. You know what I mean? Because like we split it up into three portions and then there was like other things in between. I know. I've realized that. I don't think I bit off more than I can chew. Yeah. But I think at the beginning we like did like a chapter. Yeah, right. A couple chapters. Right, one chapter. But I don't think I'm going to go back and change anything. No, no, no. Just keep it the way it is, you know. It's almost like a Matthew devotional or something you could turn into. It is, it is. But yeah, we're going to be in this for a while, especially when you get into Matthew 24 with the Olivet Discourse. I was trying to break that down. There's over 50 verses in that chapter alone. Well, and there's a lot of meat in there. So 24 and 25 are like... That sermon changed the world, you know. The Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse. Yep. All right. Sermon on the Mount. You ready? Sermon on the Mount, right? I'll go ahead and hit the beginning. Okay, well, welcome everybody to Christians of Torah. Thanks for being here. That's right. You know, we could welcome the people. We Say can. Hi. We do need to welcome to the people. The people. Uh, if you're on here for the first time, thank you so much. Make sure you subscribe, ring the bell, like it, do all that good stuff. We really need to increase our YouTube subscriptions. That's what we need. We need to, like, I, I kind of want to focus on are YouTube. Are we on YouTube? We are on YouTube. Christians with Torah YouTube? But, like, we probably get... Like, if we get several, like, probably almost a thousand listens a week on the audio or something like that, or a few hundred a week. Figure uh, out what it needs, a week. To, needs to be done. I mean, a month. So, it's like a thousand a month or so on the audio. We're getting, like, maybe 50 a, a month on YouTube. And I really want to, like, push the YouTube stuff, which is why I think maybe some more visually pleasing aesthetics. Maybe if we got some, like, maybe some filters. You know how they do those filters that make you handsome? Or, like, we could turn ourselves we don't into, need to do that. into cats or bunnies or something? No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> I don't like the hybrids. <laughs> did you Avatars. Did you see this week there was a, a court case and how they do a lot of that stuff on Zoom now, but the guy was stuck with a kitten face trying to talk and he didn't know how to get it off. And so he's like, your honor, I'm so sorry. I'm ready to proceed, but we can't get this filter. <laughs> it was great. Sorry. I, oh my, I know. And I digress. Yes, and I you digress. have digressed. So I say we should study the book of Matthew this week. Okay, it's Chapter Matthew 14. 14, verses 1 through 21. Matthew 14, verses 1 through 21. Uh, here's the title, The Death of John the Baptist. We're going to have a transition here. So who was it that heard of the fame of Yeshua? It was Herod the Tetrarch. Herod the Tetrarch. So Herod Antipas was the Roman ruler over the region where Yeshua ministered. He was only 17 years old when his father, Herod the Great, died. The kingdom was divided among three of Herod's sons, Archelaus, Antipas, and Philip II. Herod Antipas was made Tetrarch, uh, the ruler of a fourth part of a kingdom of Galilee and Perea and had a long rule from 4 B.C. to 39 A.D. So essentially Herod the Great had the whole area and then they split it up amongst the boys. It sure looks like that. That's what it looks yeah. like. So uh, it goes on to say in uh, Matthew 14, 2, and said unto his servants, this is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. So maybe there's some form of reincarnation or something he was freaking out over. So he kind of pagan, he, pagan practices or something. So this is how I picked up, because this confused me for a minute when I first read the first two verses, right? Where it says at that there's time... There's got to be a reflection. Here the t- yeah. Exactly right. Exactly right. Because I was like, wait, how John the Baptist risen from the dead? But then I understood it to mean that he was saying Yeshua was John the Baptist reincarnate. Yeah. And I mean, then it goes back like, oh, by the way, he's freaking out, Matthew's yeah. like, wait, we need to tell him John the Baptist Yeah, there was some superstition going on, yeah. It's like, wait, he's so, uh, for Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. 
Uh, for John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. So the brother can't have the brother's wife. Stole basically. the wife. Yeah, yeah, it's against the Torah. Not good. Um, Herod Antipas had fallen in love with Herodias, the wife of his half-brother, Herod Philip I. Even both were married at the time. Herodias divorced Herod the Philip I, and Herod Antipas divorced his wife, who was the daughter of the Nabataean king, Aretas IV, and they were married. So Nabataean, who is this? The Nabataeans, I don't know. It's don't interesting, either. you know. Petra. <laughs> Those are the ones that controlled Petra, remember? Yeah. The Nabataeans. Uh, so basically, John the Baptist had publicly condemned Herod Antipas for his actions. So he went after him personally. Uh, so I was trying to make like an understanding of why this was such a big deal. And I was thinking, think of somebody that has a lot of political clout. So let's, in this case, let's say the president of the United States. And so let's say the president of the United States start calling out um, people that are internationally famous for their bad behaviors, like celebrities or something like that, saying like, your behavior stinks or whatever, something along those lines. I could see then that person being very upset at this person, right? So yeah. that's how I was trying to... You know, uh, and, and I just want to say that, um, you know, uh, it goes on to say here that uh, why didn't Herod Antipas put John the Baptist to death? So he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. And he was a Levite. Now, remember, people that have like a religious zealotry uh, are much more dangerous than somebody that can be paid off. Right. So if you're a Roman or you're, you know, a Roman puppet like Herod is. In this case, you're looking at people and you're saying, okay, well, I don't need to worry about these people because I can pay them off. I can give them land. I can give them power, position, money, and they'll, they'll leave me alone. But you can't do that to John the Baptist or his followers because they're like, I don't want your money. Right. I'm willing to live in the desert. Yeah, he, he went after Herod Antipas personally. Um, what took place on Herod's birthday? So on Herod's birthday, he throws a party. And uh, the daughter of Herodias dances for him. And Herod was very pleased with this dancing. And doesn't Very, tell us more than that's that. His, that would be his niece. Correct. Daughter. To some niece. degree. Daughter niece. Because it's his half niece, right? From his half brother's wife. What a mess. So, what did Herod promise with an oath to give Herodias' daughter for pleasing him? He said that he'd give her whatever she wanted. Anything you ask shall be given. It wasn't to like you. half of his kingdom. No, he didn't say that like he, he does said in the story of to give her whatsoever she would ask. Whatever you want. Whatever you want, little girl. Yeah. What did the daughter of Herodias ask for after being instructed by her mother? So, think about the girl. Yeah. Mommy, mommy. Yeah. He said I could have whatever I want. Uh, she, the mother's like, hmm, so what's the answer? The answer is, she said, give me here John the Baptist's head in a charger. Now, I didn't and know what a charger was. That's where they serve was. food. Yeah, I didn't know what a yeah. charger was, but I guess they it's a, food. a platter. Yeah, they serve it. Like, yeah. You open it up, it's not a turkey. It's John the Baptist. So then I had this whole thought process where I went into a, a rabbit trail of understanding how many ways you can use the word charge. I can charge you right now, like run at you. I can charge a phone. I could charge you money. That's interesting. I never thought about that. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's so, difficult. yeah. And so, and the king was sorry, nevertheless, for the oath's sake and them which sat with him at meat. He commanded it to be given her. Matthew 14, 9. So he couldn't go against his word. Yeah. He had to make it happen. Because there was witnesses. So he, that's it. He was regretted. The so decision. the word sorry is the Greek word lupeo. And it means to distress, reflexively or passively. To be sad, cause grief, be in heaviness, be sorrow, or be sorrowful, or sorrow, and to uh, to be sorry or to make sorry. See, that's right out of the strong concordance. Yeah. Now, Herod did not want to kill John the Baptist because he knew the people admired John greatly. Herod also respected John and liked to listen to him. In Mark chapter 6, verse 20, it says this, For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and a holy man. And observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. So going back to this word, sorry, you know, he was, uh, he was grieved that he had to, to do this. He was taken aback by it. It really, he had a heaviness. He was sorrowful. He was sorry, you know, to distress, you know, it, like it really went against anything that he had wanted to do. You know, I think I remember. Because he imprisoned him. Being in the world and having like, you know, a loose sense of morality for myself personally but then like 
there was people that you respected, like, oh, those people that are righteous. Like you kind of, you see the righteous and you give them like the, the old, like the nod, you know? And I feel like that's how Herod was for John the Baptist. He liked John the Baptist, you know? He's like, man, that guy's, you know, speaking truth because he knows what truth is probably, yeah. Herod does, but he's just not willing to walk in it, right? right? And I think there's people on the sidelines that are like that. And that's why it seems like he liked him. So he's very upset because he's like, you know, it's these people are all going to be upset now, and I actually kind of like John the Baptist. I really don't want to have to kill him, but his pride, he allowed his pride and the fact that he made this oath to this girl, instead of saying, no, that's a stupid request, to ask for something else, you which know, he very well could have you done. You could question the character of the Herod family just because they're Idumeans. Right. You know? Yeah. So, you know, the thing is, um, let's look at this because... Um, Discuss why Herod's oath was evil and why it's important for us to keep our word in a righteous way. Mm. So that was an evil oath. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you can't justify that except for your integrity with those around you in your court or whatever, but it's wrong. Well, I think the oath came from an evil place. I think that there's an allusion here to the fact that this girl was dancing before the party, and this is probably an inappropriate party, if I had to guess. Um, now, it doesn't specifically say that, but I think that we can all read between the lines. On yeah, that. it says in Jeremiah 31 and two references that he would restore the dance. Yeah. But not that one. Not this dance. Um, that dance probably never stopped. So in that manner, I think that he's making an oath. I mean, first off, this is his, like, his daughter and his niece, and she's doing this you know, inappropriate. So he's like, oh, I'll give you whatever you want, right? So you can imagine other men throughout history that have been into a, some sort of a stupor because of a woman. And then making promises that they shouldn't or can't keep. Right? You know, this this word oath means uh, in the, the definition, just like in, in the in the dictionary, it's a solemn promise. Yeah. Often invoking a divine witness regarding one's future action or behavior. Mm. So the future action would be, hey, I've got to give the head of John the Baptist. That was the action because that was the oath. Yeah. Uh, uh, it also, uh, what would be similar to an oath, a vow, or promise? So I would like to give two examples of evil oaths. Okay. Uh, basically, is Haman and Hitler. Ooh. So Haman made an oath to put an end to these people. I'll put some money into your treasury. He made this oath. Yeah. He made a promise. Okay, and he had to fulfill it. And so the king couldn't even renounce it or cast it down. He had to make another decree for that decree. Yeah. But I thought it was interesting. And then, of course, the whole genocide of the Jewish people from Hitler that was actually a, an oath and a promise to eradicate the, that race. It's crazy. I know. So those are those are wicked oaths. I'm sure we could look up some more. Right. So I mean, so then so then Herod's oath being evil, it came comes from an evil place, right? Uh, and so you shouldn't just make open-ended promises like that in the first place, right? Yeah. So it's not a good thing to do. But also, it's important for us to keep our word in a righteous way. So I think that there is an exception to vows. Um, that when you realize that your vow was made unrighteously, that you can pray for forgiveness and revoke it. You know, this reminds me of something, too, because, boy, we can just go back and look. Let's really think this out now. You definitely have the Roman government in there mm -hmm. controlling everything, oh, yeah. allowing them to worship. So, But what's interesting is, though, in within Jerusalem or within these regions, you had this bad council, bad government. Oh, yeah bad kings or whatever. It's almost like when you go to a county or something, it's just rotten and bad, and or the state of California, all the stuff that you know, was done <laughs> the in California, whole state California, the whole state. <laughs> Poor but, California. Or even certain counties, you know, like how, oh. how tough and how strict they made it. Even Australia was horrendous. Oh, yeah. They're having elections, you know, but they're going to be cleaning house, I'm sure. But, um, yeah, can you imagine, like, being on a lockdown, like, for two years? That's like, You insanity. can't even travel in all the, Australia and all that. So, basically, you know, you can have some bad rulers, Oh, yeah. Within your county, within your government, within local municipalities. You know, like we got a great, you know, you think about um, the law enforcement and all that, you know. Uh, what is it, Sheriff uh, out of Polk County? Grady Judd. Oh, yeah. World famous. That guy, he don't play around. He does not play around. You know, he was like, uh, you know, he, he was saying at one time, I'd like to get his sound bites. Just put those together. Oh, yeah. Like he was talking about, listen, if you're going to go. And you're going to go around to these homes and you're going to be wanting to riot or break something. He goes, you're going to get shot. Yeah. And you're going to get killed by a homeowner. That's right. So don't even think about going near the residential homes and areas unless you want to be shot and you want to die. 
and I think that's not his quote, but it's along those lines. He was oh, just yeah. warning them, if you guys are going to start violence and riots, be prepared to get shot by homeowners. Because if you go in these neighborhoods. Oh, yeah. So anyway, he, he said it. And I thought it was a good warning, you know. So, you know, this goes back to these things, you know. Um, what, what do you think about that? I mean, you know. Uh, well, to your point about I mean, the oath, the so. counties and things like that, just real quick. We went to a, an event f- for all pro pastors, but the main sponsor was County Citizens Defending Families. I can't remember county, that, citizens, yeah. county Citizens for Freedom or something like that. Or defending Freedom. So I think it was CCDF, County Citizens Defending Freedom. Anyways, what a cool organization that all these other organizations are affiliated with because they just understood that the federal government is corrupt and they're probably over the, the hill. We can't, there's, not that we can't save it at some point, but that it, that's not the focus. The focus has to be on the state and local and municipal governments because that's going to have the most impact. To your point, that when there was lockdowns, it's like even when the president and the governor were saying you know no to masks or lockdowns, the mayor of Tampa was in um, and the the commission and things like that were going along and putting mandates on the people from a local standpoint. So there's there's something to be said for being participating in especially your local um, you know politics and things like that. Yeah. So once again, you know, we have a lot of leaders making bad decisions. Right. Hurting people. Right. Uh, so where was John the Baptist beheaded? In prison. In the prison. Uh, John lost his head, and Yeshua is the head of the body of Christ interesting it's almost like you know they were saying are you the christ yeah yeah. he took his head off Mm. that right there would say no yeah because he's not the head so yeah so we have uh yeshua is the head of the body of christ uh matthew chapter 14 verses 11 and 12 and his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel and she brought it to her mother and his disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told jesus Mm. So John the Baptist was called to prepare the way of the Lord, who was his cousin, and John was six months older than Yeshua. John was a priest from the tribe of Levi and was called to the wilderness to preach his message of repentance. The people came out to hear him and do mikvahs. Very interesting. You know, the priesthood was so corrupt that God created his ministry out there in the Judean wilderness. People came and they heard the message of repentance. And then, of course, they were doing mikvahs. So Yeshua came to John the Baptist to be baptized by him to fulfill all righteousness, which is a That's ceremonial right. part of the law, not dealing with a, a clean and unclean Messiah, but uh, the ceremonial part of the law he, to fulfill all righteousness. So uh, he had to be baptized just like when the children of Israel came out of Israel or out of Egypt go, to go to, towards Israel and the promised land. They crossed through the, you know, the sea. So um, I want to just... I guess I could just close with this, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Ryan, for the next page. But I want to say this, and this is just my own theory, my own thought. And when I meet John the Baptist, we're going to settle the score here. Because I don't want to insinuate anything, but I was just thinking, you know, the Scriptures do not tell us that John the Baptist was called to publicly go after Herod Antipas. Um, Sometimes we can go outside the will of God because of our own free will. So we're called to certain things, Ryan, but sometimes we want to go and do this. Or I'm going to do that. You know, one of the examples I like to give is that you'll see that some people are great public speakers. Some people are great authors. But sometimes you can't be both. Yeah, that's tough. So, like, you really want to be a public speaker, but that's not really your strong suit or your gift. But you're a great author. You can write great books. People read your books. But when you speak, you're not real, you know. Dynamic. Yeah, there's not, there's nothing there, really. Not the gift. Yeah, but I'm just saying that, you know, um, it's so funny that um, when they asked me to be the worship leader, I only knew so much and could do so much. My skill set wasn't that good. Gotcha. So like when Susie came along, I wasn't like jealous of her. Yeah. Boy, she can play <laughs> You're like, bar goodness, chords and this and that. Somebody that knows. And then I got my son doing harmonies. Oh, yeah. Putting the things together, writing level. his own music and yeah. stuff. and just blew me out of the water. Well, yeah. I'm like, wish I could have done that. Yeah. No, I did my part. I enjoy playing the guitar for what I can yeah. play, the chords and everything. That makes two of us. I got to play the mighty one of Israel. I like the capo. Uh, yeah, the capo. <laughs> so so I'm only saying this because, you know, in my time of reflection, I know Yeshua was quite saddened uh, over the death of John the Baptist. And I thought they kind of played it out really good in The Chosen. Jesus was trying to warn John the Baptist, do you yeah. really want to do that? You know, and 
you know, we're, we're in a fallen world and these things. Yeah, yeah. Says, no, I'm going, you know, and she said, okay. So I thought that was interesting in the, in the chosen, that particular series yeah. of John the Baptist. The issue in that, it, it get the impression that he sees that as like palace intrigue and a distraction that, that John the Baptist was going after or something along those you lines. You know, I tell you, I, uh, I mean, we can make jokes about the president and do different things. I mean, but the Lord really kind of scolded me about pray for your leaders. Yeah. Well, when you think about uh, that, the the parallels, you know, Herod is is kind of a puppet monarch. Yeah. And, you know, there's some parallels you can draw there to the current administration, um, you know, to say the least. Uh, yeah. You know, I think also, um, you know, Yeshua loved John the Baptist, as you mentioned. And they were cousins. Right. But God in his sovereignty, I think, knows that John the Baptist's job was to prepare the way for Yeshua. And as long as John the Baptist is on the scene and his ministry is in full swing, Yeshua is probably hanging on the sideline waiting for that opportunity to come and step on the scene in a bigger way, right? And you almost get the impression that the Lord used this situation to pull John the Baptist out, right? And that that way the ministry of Yeshua could blossom and flourish from an earthly standpoint. And, um, you know, obviously I don't know, you know, I don't know the, if that's exactly why God did it the way that he did it or not, but it seems like that's what happened. Uh, and that all the people that were followers of John the Baptist seem to then attract, I think, themselves to Yeshua's ministry and become part of that. You know, the violent taketh by force. They sure do. Because when you're, you're in a transition, you know, you think about the, uh, how volatile it is for the Jewish people to live in Israel. And the, the stabbings, the rock throwing, cars and stuff. You know, you think about um, the next phase of God's redemptive plan of all these people coming out of the nations and and wanting to support the Jewish people and help them and be a part. Ephraim. Yeah. Ephraim. 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 You know, and how that looks, I don't know, but God knows. But I think, uh, you know, there's going to be some... Uh, some payback when Ephraim and Judah come together. Yeah. So you want to jump into uh, the next section here? I the do. The next subject matter, which is all you? That's right. So we're going to go from uh, chapter 14 now to verses 13 through 21. And this is Yeshua feeds the 5,000, right? <sighs> now, if this is in chronological order, this is this is rough. I mean, to go boom from the death of uh, yeah. John the Baptist into, you know, dealing with And we'll talk about that, his time of reflection. So it says here, when, when Jesus heard, and this is verses 13 and 14, when Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. So he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. See, so he had a, a time of reflection. Yeah. I think uh, the ESV says desolate place. Yeah. So this, uh, I think, is prone to be the Greek equivalent of wilderness from the Old Testament. So the intention here is that he's getting away. You know, um, he's trying to get away. Well, here's the thing. Yeshua went to lonely places. Oh, yeah. Lonely places. Right. So go ahead. So after Yeshua heard of John the Baptist's death, he got into a ship and went into a desert place. This is probably done for a time of reflection and prayer. I agree with that. He's trying to get away. I mean, if Jesus prayed, what are we doing? This is crazy. What a good example he is. I know. Yeah, I was having a conversation oh, this week about that. Oh, prayer's boring and this and that and whatever. I, you know, I'm like, yeah. oh, we need to be praying, you know. Yeah. Your flesh may not like it, but your spirit I'll tell you, I was quickened it. by the Holy Spirit because I've been saying a lot of prayers, but I really am praying for our community. It's good. Every sheep, every person, every family, just praying, Amen. praying for the I people. I like it. I just was quickened, like, you know. I covet prayers. I, I, I can't get enough of it. So the people followed him on foot out of the city. So they found out about him, that he's going to be out there, and they went to follow him. And so when Yeshua saw the great multitude, he was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. So I think, imagine, he, he's getting away out into the wilderness, but like this whole multitude of people follow him into the wilderness. He's like, we're in the middle of nowhere, yeah. and you people are following me. So he sees their, their passion, and he has compassion on them. After seeing that. And so it says the word compassion here is the Greek word uh, splagnizomai. Yeah. And it means to have the bowels yearn, feel sympathy, or to pity. See, empathy, compassion. Yeah. Compassion. 
So, and when it was evening, this is verse 15, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place and the time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals or food. And so the disciples came to Yeshua to tell him that it was getting late and the people needed the opportunity to go into the villages to buy food, right? So, hey, you got to chill out so that the people can go, you know, and I can imagine going to Yeshua and being like, hey, uh, you're going a little long. Can you uh, maybe cut it short so the people can go eat? You know, it is interesting the time that he did come. Like I said, you know, you had the Roman government was corrupt. Priesthood was corrupt. Uh, the, the, you know, the local government's corrupt. And it's like here he is. In the middle of this mess, the Messiah. Yeah. It almost like, I'm going to go down there and fix this thing. Yeah. Like, and I think even today, I mean, if we stop and think about all the different religious institutions or religions. Yeah. And, 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 and all the, the lies. And then you've got the government. Then you've got, of course, you know, even among Christianity, the just not doing what they're supposed to be doing. No. You know, I, I just... It's kind of it, that he really, he did come at the most perfect time then. Because if you have a revived Roman Empire in the last days, you still have all those little parts. Yeah. That just came to my mind that those little parts of, of a revived Roman Empire, you know, democracy. It's interesting. The Church of Laodicea in the Greek, it means person's rights or people's rights. I have rights. Mm. You know, like that's not fair. Really? And, we, and that's what we'll do. You know? Yeah. That, and I'm thinking, wow, you know, that's that's kind of interesting that, you know, if you look at the first time he came, the second time, we're almost like seeing the same kind of thing in a way. Who's really hungry for God? You yeah. Know? I hear stories of people leaving the church and meeting their homes now because they're just not getting fed. Yeah. You know, and I and I can probably relate to that. Hey, yeah. why can't we really read the Bible together? And, and it's kind of interesting, like the first century church model. Sure. You know, I got to share that with they somebody devoted themselves at a restaurant. To the, the about, breaking of bread. She was uh, raised a Mennonite. Oh, and uh, of course they've got some. They had some strict things, and for sure. They had some off the wall stuff that you know among the Mennonites that were pretty strict and you know dogmatic yeah. or whatever. But yeah, so I think this is interesting, and um, you want to go ahead and continue about yeah. The sympathy so part. so the the disciples come to yeah. Yeshua to tell him, you know, hey, you need to give the people, um, you know, a chance to go eat. And what does he say to them? Oh, number thirteen. Uh, he goes, hey, they need not depart. Hey. Give them to eat. Yeah, give them something to eat. Feed them. Yeah, you feed them. (laughs) And so what did the disciples say in regards to the food? You know, it's funny. Micah was in a group, and I heard what he said is, I'm not giving up my food. (laughs) We have here but five loaves and two fishes. Yeah, so I could understand. If you only had five loaves and two fishes, and that's all you got, and you got... So I I was thinking about this. So what was it? It said there was 5,000 people. Is that right? Yeah. I don't think we got to that part yet. Um, But... So it's 5,000 people. Yeah, we don't know. It's till later. Yep, yeah, it was 5,000 people. I was thinking about this, and it says that was the men. 5,000 people was the men. So it's reasonable to think that we're talking fifteen to 20,000 people, right? So you've been to Amelie Arena. Okay, if Amelie Arena holds... 20,000. Like 20,000 people, it right? So at that, it's most when it's packed. All, I mean, the top, everything, just totally the, packed. That's what he would have fed? With five loaves and two fishes. <laughs> but just think, and he's out in the Galilee, though. It's like people really had to trek they that were area. They were because those rural areas... They were hungry. See what I did there? Oh, they were hungry. <laughs> but but, my, but like even Nazareth, you know, they say that, what, 2,000 people maybe at that time in Nazareth? So yeah. I'm thinking if you have 20,000 people... Yeah, it's a lot of people. That's a mega church. Oh, it's more than that. Yeah, I'm yeah. just saying. I mean, that's incredible. And they like, came out to the wilderness. There's no seats. It's not like you went to an air-conditioned right. auditorium. How could you even hear him, though? It's not like they've got concession How'd stands. How'd they do all that? Maybe they, they maybe they got fed, but they didn't hear a, a I don't single know. word. I, I don't know. I don't know either. All Think right. about all those videos, the heavenly Netflix we're going to get to watch. Oh, look, here's Jesus walking on water. Oh, this look. is when he did this. Look, Peter gets out of the boat. Peter's like, oh, yeah, man, I was the man. Yeah. Until I saw those waves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whoops. Well, that's next week or two weeks from now. Or all right. So the number seven means perfection, completeness, and fullness. So we're taking the five and the two. So yeah. five fishes and two, lo- or that's five good. loaves and two fishes. And so when did uh, so when they told him about their limited amount of food, what was Yeshua's response? Hey, bring them hither to me. Bring me the food. Bring me the five loaves and the two fishes. Bring them to me. So this is a good part. Verse 19. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass. 
and took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples then to the multitude. So Yeshua had a ministry of helps in full operation when he had the disciples distribute the food to the multitude. Wow. Very interesting. Now, I love this because I think of it as the way that he did this. He says the bracha, right? He says the blessing, you know. Right? Right? Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. So he says the blessing, you know. Um, My thing is, how did they distribute it? Did they have trays? Did they have baskets? Well, it says they brought back 12 baskets, right? So I, I know. It but says, I, says but they, they I'm did just eat. saying, so when he's multiplying food, is it going into a buffet? Or is it going into, I mean... Yeah, single file line, everybody. Uh, what's going on? Yeah. Or do they have like a basket and they just it just kept replenishing? I guess. That's even cooler. Bizarre. Yeah, it is bizarre. That's like the wine, you know, water to wine. But I'm just thinking, okay, he, he multiplied food so everyone could eat and they had leftovers. You're going to talk about this. But I'm thinking, how did he, how did they even implement that? <laughs> I know. I mean. How did the oil stay I mean, like, in the lamps at, for the Hanukkah story? There was a story about a Holocaust uh, camp, I believe, where they had like a medicine or something that they needed, and that they only had like a week's left or whatever, and it lasted for two months until the, and then as soon as the the replenishment came, it, it ran out. Things like that. I mean, there's miracle after miracle that God has done. Um, and you know, you can take this miracle and you can compare this to the wilderness and the giving of the manna, because they're out in the wilderness, right? They're out in the desert place. Did you read all that? No. Did you already get there? No, you, I think you're at... Uh, I mean, I just did number 16. I haven't done 17 or Okay, yeah, yet. do 17. All right, and they did eat and were filled, and they took up the fragments that remained uh, that remained 12 baskets full, and that was verse 20. And then verse 21, and they, and they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. And so so you got to keep that in mind, you know. Yeah. It's telling you it was more than 5,000. So Matthew states that there were 5,000 men present in addition to the women and children. And this scene recalls the nation of Israel wandering in the wilderness after Exodus and God's gracious provision of manna for his people. Wow. That. That's true. He did provide. And so the explicit mention of 12 baskets left over may symbolize the 12 tribes of Israel as well as the abundance of God's provision. <laughs> I like that. And once again, Yeshua does a miracle before many witnesses when he multiplied the food. He's God. <laughs> he is. He's not just the son of God. He is God. That's right. He multiplies food. See, this, this natural realm really stinks. It does. It smells like fish. <laughs> Something fishy about it. See, Jesus loves sushi. So I'm just thinking about this. It makes so much sense now, Ryan. The 17 works of the flesh. Walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You purpose to walk in the spirit. Yeah. You know, just like with me, you know, if I very gregarious and carry on and demonstrative you know i don't have to be like that i can be calm cool and collective yeah so it's interesting how we can actually catch ourselves when there's a situation where you could lose it and you handle it you yeah. just you just handle it and you say you know what i'm gonna handle this in a mature way yeah you know and i just think that that's the the beauty of it all that god is outside nature and time I just can't even fathom that. You know, it's interesting getting up uh, to go to the bathroom and sleeping at night and then dreaming and then going back to sleep and dreaming another dream. Yeah. And then getting up again because I drink a lot of water. And it's like, you know, I'm thinking all these dreams. It's like, but you don't even realize how much time has gone by. Eight hours or something, you know. So it's kind of like, you know, when you, when you look at your, your age or, or where you're at in time. You know, we're, we're, to, we're to number our days, but to think about it like, you know, time is a natural thing because of the sun, moon, and the stars and all that. Time is real because we age. We're in a time capsule. We're in a time warp. We're in time, and uh, we're never meant to have that. We were meant to live forever and have no watches. Yeah. So it's interesting to find out what would have happened if... Uh, if um, if Adam and Eve had not sinned, if you didn't have the fallen nature. But see, I think that's, eternity is in every man's heart. So I'm thinking, you know, that's what we really have to look forward to 
is outside the natural realm. Yeah. No more time. Remember, no more sun. Yeah. No more moon. So there won't be no more Hebrew calendar. Huh. No lunar calendar. Wait, no calendar debates or disputes? So I find this interesting, though, with what Yeshua did to really, he, he assures us as his sons and daughters that, hey, you know, I got you, I got this. We don't like anything, Ryan. We, we, li- we really lack nothing. I mean, it's yeah, just, like, it's, there's just a lot of materialistic things. There's a lot of materialism. I mean, think of all the things you can eat and drink right now. Like the grocery stores are just full of all kinds of stuff. That's right. All kinds of stuff. So I, I find this interesting. So, um, so discuss any miracles that have happened to you personally in your life. I do, I do know of one. And I've got to go back and look up my medical folder in my file because it was about that thick. But I was in a couple car accidents and I had three bulging discs. Oof. And they basically said that you'll never work out again, never exercise again. And I was in my early 20s. And um, then, I, of course, I went to the chiropractor and then I went to the, like got massages and things because I was in a lot of pain and different things. Uh, bad enough, you know, to where, you know, the uh, the car that hit us was doing like 50. And, I'm, and I just saw darkness. And I kind of came to. But um, it was like, it was uh, messed me up really, really bad. There was another accident too on 60 that I had been in. Somebody had hit me or something. But the thing is, Ryan, you know, my chiropractor was like, okay, well, you know, we got to be careful how we do this and this and that. And so um, I had an MRI done because they wanted to see exactly what, what's going on there, like another one. And they were gone. Oh, wow. The bulging discs were gone. There was no damage to my vertebrae whatsoever. That's incredible. And here it is. My chiropractor wasn't even a Christian, but a good chiropractor. One would hope that he is now, right? Well, I mean, you never know. I might see him again, but he retired. But anyway, make a long story short, you know, he goes, this is, he said, this is, I can't explain this. This is just a bona fide miracle. Huh. Use those words, huh? Bona fide miracle. So, yeah, so I thought that was interesting. And so that happened after I became born again, and I hadn't realized it. So God did a lot of things for me. Yeah, he did. Before I became born again. And then when I became born again, he really did a quick work on me. He did a lot of things in one night. One night was like a an eternity. Like a whirlwind. I mean, I can just tell you story after story that night, what he showed me, what he told me. Because Ryan, he wanted my spirit to yeah. understand these things. Yeah. And I tell you, that that's a miracle. Three bulging discs. Absolutely. Gone. Yeah. I can work out. I can jump on the rebounder. I can run. And people that have had bulging discs and had surgery because of it and things like that would can testify to the, the bad nature of having that. You know, just imagine you're just waiting for it to blow up. Or, right. Or become whatever. Right. To where, okay, now we're going to go in. That's What hope is there for that? Yeah, no, that doesn't sound good at all. No, I want it to get better. <laughs> so uh, I have on several occasions... Um, especially when it happens to do with like ministry or events or things like that, there'd be rain like starting and coming, you know what I mean? And I've prayed and like literally watched God move the weather. I've had that happen on, on multiple occasions because I, I believe by faith we can, we can ask God for those things, especially when we're in alignment with his will, right? It's not like, Hey Lord, I'm, I want to go to the beach today. Can you move the, not that he wouldn't do that for you, but. Um, that would be considered a miracle, I would think. Oh, you absolutely. can control the weather. Well, I, I it's mean, a I, sign and wonder. I don't control anything. It's a sign and wonder. But I have petitioned and watched it happen. It's a sign. Absolutely. I'm going to stop the rain. Yeah. Remember, it was the prophet said for it not to rain for three years. That's right. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah. a long time. You talk about hard times. Oh, yeah. Go back and think about that. COVID was just two years. Right. But imagine no rain for three years. That's rough. That's, I, don't, I can't even imagine yeah. what was going on at that time. That even been rough for like the waterway of Joseph, even with his whole you know plan of irrigation and everything. That'd still be tough, you know. Yeah, people actually talk about traveling, and they know they're not going to get there on time, and God gets there, gets them there on time. That's, yeah, miracles, you know, things that don't make sense. The like, incredible stories. You can only go so fast. So, all right. So, what two points can be learned from Matthew chapter fourteen, verses one through twenty-one? I have two points here. Basically, what I would like to say is uh, with with John the Baptist and the miracle of the multiplying of food, I would say, number one, those who prepare the way for the move of God can become martyrs. Mm. 
Awesome. So encouraging. Thank you for that. Yeah. You know, my <laughs> father-in-law who died of cancer and went to be with the Lord. Yeah. He got everything set up on the property, yeah. never preached one message from the pulpit, and the Lord took him. Hmm. Number two, God can do miracles, and we can believe for miracles. That's right. So my second point is basically the same as yours, which is expect miracles. Um, you know, here on earth, we as Christians, we live in a different paradigm than everybody else, and we should live in a way and believe in a way that God will work on our behalf and that we should expect miracles to happen, especially when we're walking with him and in his will. So that was my point number two. My first point was be mindful of the agreements that you make. Make sure you know the terms and conditions. That's a good thing. Right? Uh, make sure that uh, you understand the fine print. That'd be a good one. Watch what you say. And when you make vows or promises or agreements, make sure you understand the possible consequences, right? So like co-signing for something. You only co-sign for something if you know that you can pay that should yeah. the person not pay. You want to take the responsibility. Correct. As if you're doing it yourself. There's things out there. So when you make a vow, don't just do it um, willy-nilly. You know, that's good. It is good. So what a great study. It is a good study. This is a good one. All right, Father, we love you. We thank you so much. We thank you that you brought us all the way to chapter fourteen of Matthew. God, what an awesome journey this has been. We thank you for the, your continued revelation to each of us, everyone that's listening to the sound of my voice, everyone that's here in this building. God, the whole community of Beit Tehila. Uh, everyone around the world that serves you, every one that believes on Yeshua, God, we just pray a blessing over them, God, that in their lives that you would multiply things uh, in their lives, the resources that they have so that they can serve you better and that the word of God can be made manifest all around the world and the gospel can spread everywhere, the good news of Yeshua, Jesus Christ. And so we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Don't forget to remind everybody about the counting of the That's Omer. That's right. Today is up the to 38th day of the counting of the Omer. We're counting up to Pentecost Sunday to Shavuot, right? The Feast of Weeks. And we're very excited about that. And so the counting of the Omer goes 50 days all the way up, right? From the Sabbath during the week of Unleavened Seven Bread. Seven Sabbaths plus one day will take plus. us to June 4th in the evening. That's right. That's right. So we've got 21 people going to Israel for Shavuot. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Good witnesses. So, all right. If you need to reach me, it's Ryan at twopraise.net, or you can comment on any of our social media platforms on any of our videos, and I'll see it. And uh, I don't know. That's it. Bless you guys. Have a great week. <laughs>